Hi, welcome and thank you for joining our webinar today on tax management strategies. Costantino. I'm an advisor here with the Wild Wealth Management Group. And a little bit about me. I started my career in financial services in about 2012. Graduated from Arizona State University with a degree in finance. Um, and I do hold my Series 76365, as well as my Certified Financial Planner designation. Uh, and happy to be here at Wild Wealth Management. Uh, we have a, a big group here that helps support us and a lot of advisors here that a lot of you guys may know and work with. So, you know, this here is our Scottsdale team. Then we have our Tempe team, Glendale team, and then our remote offices in Tucson, Payson, and San Luis Obispo. Um, so we'll dive right in here. Essentially, our goal today is kind of talk through some of the main uh, you know, pieces in, in the overall uh, tax landscape, the recent tax overhaul, you know, kind of what that may look like for you as an investor, and then really, how can we apply that to your investments and what does that look like as we move forward, right? So you know, starting out, really looking back to 2017, a handful of years ago, we had the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, right? That, that came and took place as one of the biggest overhauls that we've seen in the past 30 years. You know, that was a lot of the things that we're all aware of in regards to the business tax rate going from 35% down to 21%. That also changed a lot of the individual tax rates a little bit here and there. Uh, it did repeal the alternative minimum tax. It placed a cap on, you know, the, the state and local tax deductions. As well, though, a main thing that that did as well is, is really change that standard deduction. So that's, you know, when, you know, uh, back a few years ago, everybody used to itemize deductions if you owned a house or, you know, had some of these SALT deductions as reference. But now with the increased standard deduction as well, you know, it does seem to change that tax code and really tax strategy as well, right? So, you know, really looking at some of the main changes that we've seen in 2017, and then some of those were overhauled again in 2020 with the SECURE Act as well. Uh, and really kind of looking at that tax landscape. Uh, now, when we look at taxes as a whole, right, we've got the wealthiest 20% of taxpayers, they pay 87% of all taxes, right? So really it is, it is a little bit top-sided from that standpoint as to really who is covering that bill. Uh, but at the end of the day, you'd be surprised when you look at the top 20%, really that's going to be households with a gross income of about $112,000 or more. Um, then when you look at the bottom 20% of taxpayers, really a lot of them actually function in a negative tax rate environment, meaning that essentially they are deductions and credits uh, exceed the income that they have and are actually getting money back from that standpoint. So it is interesting to see when you look at it from a statistic perspective, really what, where that gap is and, and kind of what that looks like for you know, average America. Right? Uh, when we look at taxes, right, taxes come in a variety of ways. So you know, as a working individual, you're going to pay taxes in the, in the standpoint of uh, you know, your federal state taxes with employment, but as well as a working individual, you're going to pay Social Security tax, as well as Medicare taxes at the same time, right? Now, when you look at a retiree, they're going to be focused more on the federal and state. Uh, but then at the end of the day, with state taxes, you're going to have your local taxes, your property taxes, and everything there. So, you know, really, when you look at tax bills, they can come in many, many shapes and forms. And, you know, our goal here is to help you kind of look through that and, and kind of navigate those waters the best you can, especially as things change over time. Uh, you know, th this slide essentially just shows, as we look at taxation, really what that impact can look like. This is just an example. And when you look at the 92-year period uh, from 1926 to 2017, you know, what does that look like, right? And we're looking at an average annual return for stocks at 10.2%. When you look at a tax bill, uh, on average, really, you're looking at an after-tax return of 8.2%. So really what this goes to show, and this is this is very specific to a scenario that we built out, but at the end of the day, what this goes to show is that realistically, your tax situation, it is very important to be cognizant of what those tax rates are, how are we managing those, because really, we want to be keeping as much of that return in your pocket as we possibly can, and being as tax efficient as possible over time. Uh, the last slide in, in regards to taxes as a whole, and I, and I think this really speaks to planning, right? planning and working with your advisor. Because at the end of the day, yes, we had a major overhaul in 2017, another one in 2020. But realistically, since 1940 to 2017, 
we've seen 81 major tax changes over that period of time. So realistically, what that means is that as we do move forward, there's going to be more, right? You know, as of recent, we saw the required minimum distribution age from change from 70 and a half to 72, and it could change again, right? And so, you know, a lot of these changes that really take place, uh, they do really factor into planning and, and really what that could look like for you. And, you know, that's the biggest thing that we're here to help you with as an advisor is really navigating those waters over time as to, you know, hey, what happens if tax rates do change again next year, right? Or, um, you know, the tax situation changes from that perspective. And we want to make sure that we're staying on top of that for you. Now, when we shift gears here and now we start to move into, hey, when, when we look at investments, you know, how can we be cognizant of these tax changes and these tax rules and how can we apply those to your situation, right? And so when we look here, we're looking at really two, two major ways to focus on tax savings, right? The first is really tax exempt investments. So in a regular investment account, what types of investments can we have in there that's really going to be appropriate for your situation? And then we have tax deferred investments, right? Those are ones that we can really lower your current taxable income and have that money grow tax deferred over time, right? So, you know, we'll talk through each of these, but at the end of the day, on the tax exempt side, you have municipal bonds and then you have funds, right? So these are money market funds, whether it be tax exempt money market funds, whether it be, you know, municipal bond funds as well, right? These are going to be situations where you're looking at how can we minimize our tax bill in a regular investment account, right? Then on the tax deferred side of things, that's where you're talking about your IRAs, your 401ks, um, annuities, or life insurance as well, right? And how do those play into your situation based on what your investments may look like, right? So first, looking at the municipal bond market, right? So this is really, this goes to show how massive that market is. So overall, there's, there's been $3.9 trillion in the municipal bond market. And of that, about $2.4 trillion at the state and local government level that's been issued. Um, you know, you're going to have other, other issuers as well that kind of make up that difference. But really, at the end of the day, when you look at a municipal bond market, this is going to be your states, your municipalities, your local governments really issuing these bonds so that they can finance operations within the state or municipality or whatever the case may be, right? Um, and so because of that, they give tax-favored treatment, and so you can have federal tax exempt uh, status on a lot of this, as well as depending on the bond, depending on the state that you buy it in, potential state tax favor and benefits as well there. So really, when you look at it, it's a great place to invest from the standpoint of really saving you from a tax perspective. However, there are downsides as well, right? By buying a bond for a certain municipality or a certain state, you know, if that state does default or, you know, something does go wrong, there are risks involved with a credit risk or whatever the case may be. You do want to be careful. It's not always just something that you want to buy all the time, right? The rate's going to be different, and you're going to have a lot of different pros and cons from that perspective. Um, when you do look at municipal bonds, there's multiple ways to purchase them, right? You have one side where you're going to buy those municipal bonds as individual bonds, um, and then you have bond mutual funds, right? And that's going to vary based on your risk tolerance and really your desire for that investment and what your goal is, right? On the individual bond side, you have a drastic selection to be able to pick from, right? You can essentially go in and choose which bond you want and from what carrier and, you know, what duration and whatever the case may be. And in that situation, realistically, the goal there is you're going to buy that bond and you're going to hold it all the way to maturity. As long as you hold it all the way to maturity, there's a very high likelihood that you're going to get all of your principal back and you essentially most likely got dividends along the way, right? In this situation, it's going to be self-directed. You're going to pick the bonds that you want, right? You're going to essentially have no annual costs, but really the downsides are is that you are kind of locked into that individual bond until maturity. If you do choose to go and sell it before maturity, you could end up selling at a premium or a discount, and you could lose some of those funds upon sale, right? On the bond mutual fund side of things, there are pros and cons as well. Um, so the big pros is you've got diversification. The fund is going to be buying many, many individual bonds to build that fund. Uh, you're going to have much more liquidity. So the ability, if you say, hey, I need, I need these funds for something short term, you have the ability to go in and take those funds out from that bond fund at whatever interval, whatever amount that you may need to be able to fund whatever, whatever your situation is on that side. Right? So you do have a lot more liquidity, a lot more diversified. 
Um, there are low minimums a lot of times to get into these funds. You can help fit it into a portfolio with a certain risk schedule. And you do have somebody professionally managing that fund, right? The downside with a bond fund is that essentially because there's a lot of existing bonds in that fund, as rates do change in the current environment, that does impact the price of that fund. So for example, if you buy into this fund and interest rates go up over time, then the value of the existing bonds in there at the lower rates, they're going to be worth less. So the price of those funds could come down. So there are going to be some price fluctuation on a daily basis with a bond fund, whereas with an individual bond, you're not going to have that price fluctuation. Once again, if you hold that to maturity, you're not going to have any sort of issues or liquidity issues. You're going to make sure that you end up getting what you essentially put in at the end of it. It's just the fact that you might be locked up in that period of time. Right? When we look at tax equivalent yield and we look at do I buy an a regular bond, right, a government bond or a, a corporate bond, or do I buy a municipal bond, right? Really what that comes down to is tax equivalent, taxable equivalent yield, right? What that really is is looking at it and saying, hey, if I can get a regular corporate bond at X percent return, okay, what do I need to earn on a tax-exempt bond to be able to have that tax-exempt return be higher than what I would have gotten on the taxable bond after I pay taxes, right? So essentially, this chart is, it goes to show, and it says, hey, on the bottom, if you take your taxable equivalent yield, so your tax-exempt yield, and then you look at your tax bracket on the left side, and you say, well, what would I have to earn in a taxable bond to be able to pay taxes on that dividend and still net a higher return than if I were to just simply have bought the tax-exempt bond, right? And so. This chart goes to show at a high level of what those differences look like. There is a lot more involved, though, because it's not always going to be lockstep from the standpoint of a municipal bond paying X percentage less than a corporate bond or vice versa, because it's all going to depend on that municipal bond, right? Which municipality are you buying from? Which state are you buying from? You know, are you buying one that has a lower credit rating and giving you a higher return or whatever the case may be? So there really is going to be a situation where it really is more than just the simple math equation. However, this really does help when you look at it from the standpoint of saying, hey, you know, in evaluating, should I buy a municipal bond versus just a regular corporate bond? You know, does it make sense to save the taxes and have a tax-free distribution when you may be in a situation where you can say, well, no, I'll take, I'll take the regular dividend from a corporate bond, I'll pay taxes on it, and my return will still be higher, right? So that's that trade-off that you need to be looking at, and that's where us as the advisor has the ability to really look and say, hey, you know, what does the marketplace look like right now for taxable bond dividends versus tax-exempt, and really what does that difference look like? Now, when you look at what we've talked through up to now, that's going to be more on the side of your taxable investments. How can you place those in vehicles that are going to give you very low tax burdens on an annual basis, right? Now we're looking at it and saying, when we look at retirement plans, what does that look like? So this is the difference in taking a shift of saying, hey, how can I put my funds in an account that it's not about the investments, it's the account itself that's going to give me that tax deferred treatment, right? So the major two here are traditional IRAs and 401ks or 403bs, right? Traditional IRAs for 2020 and 2021, and as of right now, 2022, the maximum contribution is 6000 or 7000 if you are 50 or older, right? On the 401k side of things, that contribution maximum is 19500 so it's a lot higher, right? Your employer plan does allow you to contribute more, and you don't have any sort of uh, income limitations that you would with a traditional IRA, right? Um, we'll talk through this a little bit more, but at the end of the day, the downside on these types of vehicles is that you are deferring those taxes, but it, a, as you progress down the road and you do get to a point where you have to start to take funds out, you are still going to pay taxes on those distributions. And if you take it out too early, you could have penalties as well. Um, you know, this slide really just goes to show, hey, wh what does it look like and, and how does this look in practice as to how much you can really save if you are looking at a pre-tax contribution? And so here, when you look at the advantage of using a qualified plan, you have scenario one, where you take $1,000 and you invest that on a pre-tax basis, right? 
if you're investing at pre-tax, all $1,000 gets invested into the portfolio to be able to grow. Right. Scenario two, you take your paycheck, you pay taxes on it, you put that money into your bank, and then you go turn around and invest that money. In that scenario, to be able to still invest $1,000, if you're in a 24% tax rate, you would have actually had to make $1,316 to be able to still take that same equivalent $1,000 and get that invested, right? So it goes to show the power of putting the money in pre-tax allows you to put a lot more in because in both scenarios, say you have $1,300 to invest, you're going to be able to have all $1,300 invested you know, in scenario one versus that $1,300 and then you pay taxes on it and then only $1,000 invested in scenario two. When you look at what do we want to do and what's the hierarchy when you talk about traditional IRAs or 401ks or employer-sponsored plans, we always want you to start with the employer plan, right? Because with the employer plan, you can contribute much more, so up to the 19500 okay? You also get, in most scenarios, some sort of a company match that they're going to help put money in as well for you, and that's free money that goes into that account for you. The other thing is that with a 401k under current tax law, there is no income limits. So you can essentially make quite a bit of money and still be contributing to that 401k. Right? Once you've maxed out that 401k, then you look to the IRA. Now, when you look to the IRA, the problem, there, there are a few downsides to it. So there are income limits to contributing to an IRA to be able to take a deduction for that contribution. You can always contribute to the IRA, but you may not be able to deduct that contribution. And the contribution amounts are much lower, right? 6000 instead of 19500 right? So realistically, what it comes down to is we're not speaking to them too much in this presentation, but after you have maxed out your 401k, once you get to the point where you're at the IRA portion, that's where we want to be having the conversation around, do we use a traditional IRA or do we look into a Roth IRA? Or at that time, do we then look at the taxable investment account, which we were talking to earlier, as to municipal bond funds or you know, tax-favored investments in a regular investment account as well? Right? So there is a hierarchy in the way that you want to invest when we're looking at tax-deferred accounts, especially between 401k versus IRA. Um, once you have gone through a taxable account uh, and 401k and IRA, there are a couple of other options. Those two main options are going to be annuities and life insurance. So when we talk to annuities, you have two different main types of annuities. And these annuities, you have deferred annuities or you have an immediate annuity, right? A deferred annuity essentially is where you're going to put money in. And if this is not in a retirement account, you're going to put the money into the annuity. It's going to grow tax deferred. And then essentially, once you start to pay out on the earnings, then you're going to pay taxes at ordinary income. So similar to an IRA, but you're putting in regular a chunk of change from your bank or wherever the funds come from, and then those funds are going to grow tax deferred. Uh, the, then you have an immediate annuity, which is essentially um, taking out that accumulation phase, sticking a lump sum into that annuity, and letting that annuity pay you out for an extended period of time or ideally for life. Um, now, when you look at it, you've got it. When, when you look at an annuity, you have options. You can buy an annuity in a non-qualified fashion. So, on the previous slide, that's where you're going to take money from your bank or proceeds from a house or whatever the case may be, and you're going to put that into that annuity. That annuity is going to grow tax deferred, and then essentially from there, you're going to pay out on that payout side. Right. Um, the other option is you can buy an annuity in an IRA. Now, when you buy an annuity in an IRA. There's pros and cons. Uh, you do need to make sure when you're being considered of the IRA, because the IRA is already a tax deferred vehicle, realistically, when you look at putting an annuity inside of an IRA, you're, not, you're already getting kind of double tax deferral, right? So it's not benefiting you any more than it would by not having an annuity in an IRA because you're already getting that tax deferral by holding the funds in an IRA. So there are some things to be aware of that now you're going to have some extra costs to maintain that annuity. And like I said, you don't get any additional tax savings because the funds are already inside of an IRA. Right? However, there are still benefits to putting in an, an, an annuity in an IRA if it works for you in your situation. A lot of annuities do offer guarantees, right? guaranteed income amounts. Um, they'll offer guaranteed death benefits. 
They'll offer lifetime benefits, right? So there are things in an annuity that can still make sense for you as an investor, even to hold it within an IRA. It just needs to be really vetted and make sure that it does make sense for your situation as to why are you buying the annuity, right? If it is just for tax deferral, you're already going to get that inside of the IRA. However, if it is for the other things mentioned, such as guarantees or guaranteed death benefits, then it still very much could make sense to purchase inside of an IRA. Right? The other and kind of final option to use is life insurance. Now, life insurance is a whole conversation in and of itself, right? You have term insurance or whole life insurance. However, in this scenario, we are specifically talking to how can life insurance be used as a tax deferral vehicle? And in that situation, it can only be used as in a whole life insurance policy. A term policy is not going to maintain the same type of a situation. So for this, for purposes of our conversation today, it's going to be the focus being a whole life policy. These whole life policies, essentially what this allows you to do is put money into this whole life policy as that cash value grows, the premiums paid into the policy, they're going to grow tax deferred, albeit at a much lower rate than you could possibly get in an IRA or an annuity, right? They are going to be a little bit safer. However, these are going to give you certain death benefits that you're going to get that at that time, if something were to happen, those are going to pass tax free. So you do have a lot of tax benefits on that end of things. But that cash value that is growing tax deferred, you do have flexibility. If you take funds out, you could end up with taxes and penalties. But you know, you do have sometimes an ability to take a loan against the funds or whatever the case may be there. But the moral of the story is, is just like an annuity or just like an IRA, the growth of that money is growing in a tax deferred basis. Right? So in summation, really, when you look at it from the standpoint of saying, hey, what is what is tax deferred growth look like on an actual actual practical example? Right. And in this situation, we're looking at it saying, hey, if you were to put a hundred thousand dollars into an investment, right, you let that investment grow over 20 years at a six percent rate of return. And say you're in the marginal tax bracket of 22%. Right? In scenario one, you put that money into a regular taxable investment account. Over the span of that 20 year period of time, you're going to end up with about $250,000. Right? If you take that same $100,000 and have it, say, be in an IRA or you know, other tax deferred vehicle, well, now that same $100,000 instead of $250,000 is going to grow to about $320,000. Right? Now, at a lump sum, if you were to go in and say, all right, now let's take the taxes out of that, well, you're still going to end up with about 265000 which realistically is still going to be higher than the two hundred and forty-one. So really, even after tax, you're going to end up, even at a very basic level, you're going to end up with more than scenario one. However, even here, that's not going to be the case, because if you have a tax-deferred vehicle that's grown, say, all the way to 320000 well, our goal as your advisor is to really help you spend that down in a very tax efficient way. So really the focus being that you're not going to have a lump sum tax bill. Our goal is to now take that big tax deferred bucket and unwind that slowly for you over time to be able to be cautious of how much taxes you're going to pay on an annual basis. So, you know, the goal being here is really just showing there are downsides from the standpoint that if you have a large tax deferred bucket, now, when you hit retirement and you start to spend from it, you are going to be in a situation where you're pulling all of those amounts out and it's taxable and added to you as an income. So you're not going to have the full benefit of, you know, being able to be strategic from, from a downside or from a, a liquidation perspective, because really it is going to be as simple as income. However, you were able to defer income for many, many years. And realistically, when retirement happens, you're going to have a much higher nest egg built for you to be able to then draw down. Right? So really, when we talk about this presentation and really managing your taxes, there's a lot of different things that you can be looking at, right? And when you look at a couple different scenarios, you know, you look at a two income couple and that have young kids and they're saying, hey, how do we take advantage of all of our tax credits or deductions? And, you know, should we be maxing out our 401k plans, right? Or you take another couple that's nearing retirement and say, hey, how do, we, how do we allocate our investments in a way that makes sense you know, from a tax perspective? And how do we maximize gifting to avoid gift taxes or you know, whatever other inheritance taxes that you could end up with, right? 
you know, or you look at a single parent and a business owner that says, hey, I've, I've got, you know, this business I'm starting and how can I invest in a tax advantage manner? And what are the best retirement plans out there for me that benefit me as a sole proprietor or, or an individual business owner? And, you know, how can I be saving at a maximum level, right? Or, you know, take somebody who does their taxes themselves and just says, hey, you know, am I really taking advantage of all the tax credits that I could be by using a software program and, you know, kind of doing this on my own, right? So every single person's tax situation is going to be so different that realistically, we, we really want you to be consulting either your tax professional or your advisor to really be able to say, hey, is, is this what I'm, is what I'm doing right for me or should I be making changes to it, right? And so with that being said, thank you for attending. Uh, you know, this is, this is our webinar here today on tax strategies. What I will say is if you are an existing client of Wild Wealth Management and you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to your advisor here at the firm. Uh, we're always happy to help. We'd love to answer your questions and make sure that we are doing everything that we can for you. If you're a, a potential new client, um, don't hesitate to give our firm a call and you know we're here to answer any questions or concerns that you may have. Uh, so thanks for tuning in and have a great rest of your day. We'll talk to you soon.